The slug. What other creature looks so much like something we'd find on Mars or inside of our noses? Most land slugs and their shelled snail cousins are in the group Pulmonata. This is an informal taxonomic group of gastropods that have lungs rather than gills and therefore can breathe on land. And that's about where the similarities between us and slugs end. As you might already know, slugs are a little different from us. For starters, most humans are nowhere near as slimy as your average slug is. Second of all, most humans are either male or female, whereas slugs and snails are simultaneous hermaphrodites. They have fully functioning male and female reproductive systems, so they produce and distribute sperm and also lay eggs. And yes, sometimes a lonely slug will end up fertilizing its own eggs. This delightful process is called selfing. However, to rub salt into these lonesome, selfing slugs' wounds, or just on them at all, experts think that slugs don't really discriminate much when it comes to mate selection, albeit they do have a slight preference for their chunkier cohorts. So, you heard it here first, folks, the true embodiment of the free love philosophy of the 60s is… slugs. Now, like with any free market, there is, of course, fierce competition, and this is where things really start to go downhill. You see, slugs store the sperm of all their former lovers in their bodies for months or even years before using some of it to fertilize their eggs. As you do. And it isn't like they keep all of the samples separated in there either, it's pretty much like a chowder. This makes the sperm selection process more like a raffle than a woman at the clinic flipping through a book of sperm donors. Nevertheless, slugs will do whatever it takes to get their sperm the edge. And natural selection has created some truly anatomical abominations. On the innocuous end of the spectrum, slugs will often transfer their sperm in the form of a spermatophore. This is a package that contains and protects sperm cells during delivery. Sometimes, spermatophores contain additional nourishment for the receiver. If that's the case, it's called a nuptial gift. A nuptial gift may sound like jargon, but you've probably given a nuptial gift before to a special lady or lad. Although, hopefully nothing like a spermatophore, because that would get the police called on you. Anyway, nuptial gifts come in lots of shapes and sizes. They're either exogenous or endogenous, and are edible or inedible. I hope you all know the difference between edible and inedible, but let me clarify the other terms. Exogenous means it was collected or found by the donor, whereas endogenous means the donor produced the gift inside their body. For example, an inedible exogenous gift would be a bouquet of flowers, and an edible exogenous gift would be some chocolates. An inedible endogenous gift would be a nice big booger. But I'm struggling to think of any edible endogenous gifts that normal people would ever give each other. And before anyone comments, what do you mean? Boogers are totally an edible endogenous gift. May I remind you that that's horrifically disgusting. However, even that isn't quite as bad as the violent nuptial gifts that slugs give each other. Love darts. They may sound cute, but they are not. Effectively, they're tiny harpoons that slugs and snails shoot into each other before mating. Okay, well, tiny might not be the right term. They're tiny to us, usually only a few millimeters long, but they can be up to one-fifth of the total length of a slug's body. That'd be like a human getting stabbed with a katana the length of a keyboard. The shooting of love darts occurs during the elaborate tactile courtship ritual prior to mating. When a slug finds a suitor, the two will circle and rub against each other for up to six hours. That's enough time to watch the entire first season of The Big Bang Theory, and I have to say, definitely a better use of that time. Then, once the gastropods are excited enough, they will launch their load. A few species launch multiple love darts. Notably, the Japanese snail species Euhardra subnimbosa will use the same dart to stab their partners an average of 3,311 times per mating session. Embarrassingly, there is considerable inaccuracy among these love dart shots, even though they are shot in such close contact to be more like stabs than shots. One study of garden snails found that one third of love dart shots fired failed to penetrate the partner, or simply missed altogether. And out of the two thirds of the shots that did actually make contact, some made a little too much contact. Meaning, love darts will sometimes puncture vital organs, rendering the receiver of the love dart dead. Because what says, I love you, more than stabbing someone to death? Alright, so what exactly is the purpose of these love darts anyway? A 19th century French scientist whose name I will probably struggle to pronounce, named Jacques Toussaint Benoit, was among the first to come up with an idea. 
He believed the love darts formed a permanent telepathic link between mates, keeping the gastropods in sympathetic communication with one another. In other words, feeling whatever the other felt via tapping into each other's animal magnetism. Benoit was inspired by some folks back in the 17th century who tried to unlock the power of sympathetic communication with each other. A pair of pals would remove a corresponding section of skin from their arms, and then graft the skin over each other's fresh, gaping wounds. Then, they'd tattoo the alphabet onto these patches of skin and poke a letter with a needle to transmit messages to each other instantaneously. And so, Benoit constructed an apparatus called a Paysalialinic Sympathetic Compass, or in other words, a snail telegram. This apparatus used 24 mated pairs of snails that were glued to bowls. Each pair corresponded to a letter in the French alphabet, and when one snail was poked, its mate would react. When Benoit demonstrated this contraption, it, of course, failed. However, a journalist from La Presse was impressed nevertheless, and wrote in his review that ladies could one day wear a scaled-down version of the snail telegram around their waistbands. But believe it or not, women wearing snails didn't take off. Not yet, at least. Anyway, love darts do have an actual use. They're covered in a mucus infused with hormones that make a stabbed slug more receptive to the donor's sperm, thus increasing the donor's paternity odds. As horrifying as the darts are, it's believed that they did inspire the myth of Eros and his arrow, and subsequently Cupid. So, instead of getting your Valentine a card with a baby Cupid on it, you could just give them a slug. Or, if you want them to think that you're not a psychopath, probably don't. After all, love darts are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to weird slug sex. Here are some more examples. The species Aplysia californica is a type of hermaphroditic sea slug. They have their male and female genitalia located on different parts of the body. This lets them chain as many as 20 of themselves together while mating all at the same time, like a zesty Congo line. So many other slugs will be attracted to this human sea slug centipede because, while mating, they release pheromones into the ocean. Four of these sea slug pheromones have been identified and named, and they all sound like really cheap colognes. Attractin, Enticin, Temptin, and Seductin. Yep folks, a real scientist with an actual degree seriously named these. These bonanzas will go on for hours or sometimes even days, even though it only takes a minute for sperm to transfer. So there's plenty of time to join the party, or elephant walk, or whatever else you want to call it. And speaking of weird hazing rituals, let's talk about UC Santa Cruz. Specifically, their mascot, the banana slug. These guys occasionally get their penis stuck in their partner. Look, we've all been there. But these guys take drastic measures. They, or their partner, will gnaw their little guy off in order to get free in a process called apophilation. Gives a whole new meaning to oral now, doesn't it? And no, this species doesn't regrow their penis afterwards. They simply live the rest of their lives as a female instead. And finally, perhaps the weirdest of all, are leopard slugs. They are the most acrobatic of stereotypically lethargic slugs. Two slugs will dangle upside down from a string of mucus. They need to hang upside down like this because they need gravity to help unfurl their gigantic penises which, of course, come out of their heads. They then exchange sperm with one another at the tips, and for whatever reason, natural selection has favored these slugs to have longer and longer penises, and so their appendage can be as long as the slug's entire body, which stretches up to 20 centimeters. However, some southern European varieties have penises that stretch up to almost a meter, about five times the length of their body. That'd be like if a human male had a penis longer than a giraffe. So yeah, I think we can pretty much conclude that slug sex is the absolute worst and weirdest in the entire animal kingdom.